Hello, everyone. We'll just give everyone a minute to jump on here. We'll get started very shortly. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, hello everyone, my name is Crystal Shaughnessy. I am the event specialist at EDB and I will be your host today for our webinar on fueling the DevOps movement and innovating faster with cloud native Postgres. I am joined by Gabriele Bartolini, uh, Vice President of Cloud Native at EDB, as well Hi. as Jan Kademans, who is our Global Director of Product Marketing. Before we get started, I'll just go over quickly a couple of housekeeping items. Um, firstly, the presentation is being recorded and we will be sharing the recording along with the slides at the close of the broadcast. So please keep an eye out for that email. And secondly, please note that the lines are currently muted. We do expect the presentation to last most of our time today. However, we will be taking questions as we progress through the presentation. So please be sure to put those into the Q&A panel. Um, and that being said, if there are any outstanding questions, we will allot any extra time at the end to answering those. So I think that's all. And with that, I'll hand it off to Jan and Gabrielli. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Um, thank you, everybody, um, for joining us here this morning, afternoon, evening, uh, from wherever you are um, on, on our webinar here on you know, DevOps, Postgres, and, and bringing things together. Um, I wanted to start with just throwing this out here. It's a, a statement by um, Mark Linster, um, EDB CTO, and I've seen that Mark is actually uh, on the webinar. So hello, Mark. Yes, Postgres is the most transformative technology since Linux. Um, if you start looking at you know, the history of Postgres, it's, it's been built over three decades. Um, the initial ideas that Dr. Michael Stonebreaker had back in the day obviously couldn't well, kind of foresee how the world would look like today. But if you look at Postgres, it is almost like it's built for today's world. And this is, this is also one of the things that, you know, guides us through this presentation today, guides us through the DevOps experience is also something that Gabriel will go into uh, a little bit more after this. Um, so I will take you through the initial part of the presentation. Um, and with that, I also want to ask Crystal to kind of set out our first poll question here uh, for this afternoon, which will run for um, the next few um, slides, Crystal. Yes, um, so I've just launched it. It is, um, we're wondering where are you with databases in your journey to the cloud? So we'll leave that running for a couple of slides um, and we hope to hear back from you. Um, so with that, you know, the lay of the land, and I already talked about that a little bit, it's, it, it starts for us with Postgres. Um, Postgres, again, as the most transformative technology since Linux, um, and we've seen um, the waves of open source roll across the land, the adoption of Linux, the growth and, and you know, the expansion of that. We see that happening with Postgres just the same as with Linux. Um, if you move then, you know, from, from left to right in this case, the first next big change that we see coming is, is cloud. Um, for those of you who have witnessed um, the Postgres build presentation of Dr. Michael Sombraker in December of 2021, um, he really, you know, positioned cloud as the only real next big thing that we're all going to be working with. And we see it around us everywhere, right? Everybody is talking about cloud. Everybody is working with the cloud. And then as a next step, and that's that's really what brings us here together today is cloud native. What does cloud native mean? What does it 
entail? Where does it fit? Um, and actually, how does Postgres through cloud native get into cloud? How does this all fit together? And it's actually a very interesting puzzle um, to dive into. And again, I need to use this. Um, so for this, you know, first thing before we really kick off with the content, uh, Gabriele, would you like to say yeah, a little thanks. bit? Thanks, yeah. And Hi everyone. So yeah, I'm Gabriele and uh, I'm the Vice President for Cloud Native uh, at ADV. And previously uh, I've been working with Second Quarter for more than 12 years. Uh, I was, you know, a part of the initial cluster with Simon Riggs. Um, and then I've been covering several roles, including head of global support, and uh, and then we were you know second quarter was acquired by ADB and now you know I'm I'm really happy to be part of this you know the, this major contributor for 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 Postgres. So my passions, professionally speaking, are yeah as you were mentioned before Postgres uh, Linux. Okay, so Linux Postgres and Kubernetes recently, and uh, probably the reason for loving Kubernetes is because I'm a DevOps enthusiast. So I think it's actually a DevOps culture is what led me to, to Kubernetes. I'm also, uh, I'd like to think as, a, as myself, as a, as a contributor of Postgres, I was one of the co-founders of Postgres Europe and uh, Design and Postgres users group as well. And uh, in terms of open source, uh, you know, I've been, um uh part of the initial i mean i'm probably the, the person that gave the the environment to the software but i've contributed to to this backup and recovery manager for postgres that is probably one of the most used tools for disaster recovery in postgres so and now you know here i am thanks yeah cool thank you gabriele um, my name again, uh, Jan Kagermans. Um, I've been doing databases for longer than I care to remember, um, and but actually did a whole bunch of different things in and around databases. Um, I started as you know quite a couple of people in in the database space in the Oracle technology uh, realm, and kind of five years, seven years ago. Um, really saw the light and migrated myself from Oracle to Postgres. So that's why I am very happy to be here. Um, I do um, public speaking um, and try to kind of develop thoughts around, you know, how can you strategically do more and do cooler things with Postgres? Um, so that's me in a nutshell. Um, and before we progress to the next slide, uh, Crystal, shall we close the poll and see what our audience thinks? Yes, let's do it. Okay. So let me share these results with you. Um, and interestingly enough, 60% um, of people said that databases are part of the journey. And the second most popular answer behind that was um, that they were considering it. Cool. Thank you. Um, so that's good. If, if databases are part of the journey, then you know, this could be the right place to really um, hopefully get inspiration on how some of this stuff could work. Um, so what we're going to do in, in the agenda is really introduce quickly Postgres, well, not really Postgres, a little bit EDB, um, monolithic to agile, which is basically the, the stepping stone to um, the part that really Gabriele will, will take over, which is introducing to the DORA project, introducing to um, a DevOps pipeline, and then we'll have some closing notes behind that. Um, so, you know, the intro is set. Um, cloud, cloud native, um, Postgres, but why Postgres? And um, for that, I would like to start with this. Um, a database is um, a, a, well, a part of a bigger solution, right? Nobody really runs a database just for the sake of running a database. Um, some of us database enthusiasts perhaps might have 
in the young years when they started to learn technology, just run the database and put on the CD collection or something in the database just to run some SQL queries on it. But that is already actually using the database. So if you zoom out from that first perspective, you get to this cornerstone idea, right? If you look at IT landscapes today, if you start looking at a lot of things that organizations are building and, and trying to build value with applications. What do applications thrive on is, is on data. Um, and the database, and in this case, Postgres, and in our case, Postgres is really, you know, this, this really intricate, interesting data processing platform that can really form a cornerstone in an application landscape and application development landscape. Um, so for that, you know, Postgres as, as the cornerstone, the database is a cornerstone for an application for an IT infrastructure is actually our starting point for today. Um, as I said, you know, I, I personally come from a different database background, but you could also come from DB2, you could also come from Microsoft SQL Server, it doesn't really matter. Why is Postgres different? Um, apart from the fact that what, what I said uh, a little while ago around, you know, what Dr. Mike Stonebreaker really tried to set out and, and achieve with Postgres, if you look into that, you know, it's really capable of doing a lot of, of everything. Um, migration, if you start looking at coming from different sources, you see this huge movement of, of application workloads moving from um, traditional database platforms to Postgres. Um, new application development basically always starts on Postgres or a Postgres-like platform. Um, if you look at replatforming to the cloud, and, and this, is, this is really also the, the topic of today, right? We're taking traditional env uh, environments and we're going to explore how we can bring this to the cloud, how we can use this cloud native way to, to bring applications to the cloud. But also if you start looking at what, what kind of systems, and traditionally systems of a record where you use the database, exactly as in our example with, with the CD collection, use it to store data and to retrieve data. But what we've seen is that a lot of our customers are also using Postgres for systems of analysis or even systems of engagement. So it's really a very broad set of workloads that you can use Postgres for. And you know we can expand on this for at least an hour or more, uh, but that, that would defy the purpose of today's meeting. Um, and it really works everywhere. Um, public cloud, private cloud, um, database as a server, you might have um, seen the launch of Big Animal, EDB's managed database as a service, um, that is now really starting to, to kind of play into this area. But also traditionally on, on virtual machines, on your traditional infrastructure in your own data center in from small to large really still is um, a place where Postgres feels very much at home. And again, to today's topics, um, a Postgres database in a container is, you know, long thought to be something where, you know, who would want to run a relational database in the container? Um, to me personally, that's, that's basically very much the same kind of discussion that we had, what is it, 20 years ago where, virtual machines came up and the discussion would be, I'm not going to run my database on a virtual machine. I will get storage issues. I will get all of these other problems. And that really doesn't work. Um, I think, especially for virtual machines, we can safely say that's, that's done and dusted. Today, we can say databases and containers, you know, we've been there, that's done and dusted. It's a, it's a, discussion we've we've had we've solved this and you know we really does have to really do have to move on so databases and containers is also a real thing in that sense and then you know where are you on your postgres journey um we obviously from from a commercial side from edb side speak to a lot of um, our customers that 
you know, are on various stages of their journey with Postgres. Either, you know, they're just sniffing, sniffing around. Is, is Postgres, what is it? Can I play with it? Um, does it actually work in some of the things? The, the, the questions we get is, you know, how seriously can you use Postgres for mission critical workloads, etc.? cetera? Um, expanding customers that, that have already, you know, had those first experiences with Postgres and now really going to look at um, bigger projects, more important projects, up to very, very strategic customers that, you know, have said Postgres is, is our standard solution. We run our tier one applications on it. And that is really for big banking, um, like, like a MasterCard, for instance, that run their tier one uh, brand critical applications on Postgres. So it's really something that is possible and it's really for you also to define where you are on your journey in that sense. Um, so why would you then work with a company like EDB, right? Postgres is a community open source solution. And you can do everything yourself. Um, why on earth would you want to kind of pay somebody to help you with it? Um, our EDB is the Postgres expert. And I think Gabriela said it at the beginning. Um, we were extremely happy when I think it's it's nearly two years ago now that, you know, second quarter and then EDB really came together um, and, and really, you know, establish ourselves as the Postgres experts. Um, we are the company that builds Postgres uh, and, and then not just from a number of lines perspective, but really contributing to the community, helping and supporting the community in various different ways um, that we can safely say no company has really contributed more than to Postgres than EDB together with Second Quarter now has. Uh, that also means, you know, we have the most Postgres experts. It's a, basically as simple as that. Um, 300 folks that on a day-to-day -day basis, every day work with Postgres from a technology perspective, really understand and build. Um, we've got these name committers and, and founding members like uh, Bruce Mongen, uh, Peter Eisentraut, but also uh, Dr. Michael Stonebreaker himself as advisor to the EDB board. Um, so that really, you know, if there is anything to know about Postgres, I can definitely say we've got the answer for you. So then, you know, this traditional environment um, where, you know, on, on the left-hand image, um, a big monolithic application really driving down the track. And in, in preparation for this webinar, uh, Gabrielli and myself were discussing, you know, it's not wrong um, to have a traditional monolithic application and Gabrielli will go into that a little bit more in, in, in the next slides as well. Um, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but what we see is with the growth and the adoption of cloud, a different mindset. And, and a lot of this stuff is really about mindset, right? The mindset for getting the most out of, you know, this new world of cloud and, 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 and microservices, et cetera, is to start breaking that application down from this big monolithic approach to, um, I always want to compare it to this flock of birds, right? You've got this agile group of birds. And if one bird, you know, goes a little bit to the left, all of the other birds follow, there are no collisions. And this is really how a microservices application in a, in a cloudified environment or a cloud native environment should also work. Um, if, if one of the things changes, everything changes with it, and it will just, you know, function as, as one organism built out of these individual granules. So that you know brings us also from, and and I already used a couple of these buzzwords, you know, agile, microservices, DevOps, CI/CD. We need to start translating this from you know just buzzword bingo, and everybody knows it. it when you're in a sales presentation, you can just easily take the card and just start writing them down, right? Who has the first bingo card full? 
with all of these kind of modern terms. Um, and that's what we're really going to try to give some hands and feet to today um, in this webinar. And then, you know, quickly to, to kind of um, give that a shout out. Um, Postgres in the microservices world is a new presentation that um, is created by Bruce Momjin. Um, so he's, he told me yesterday or so that his talk got accepted, um, uh, but he was unable to disclose exactly where. It's coming to a conference near you soon. Um, so please keep, a, keep an eye out for that. Um, and that actually got us through the intro, just trying to set the stage a little bit for um, for the next part. And with that, Gabriele, would you like to yeah, uh, thanks. take a thanks, pick up? Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Jan. Yeah. And so, yeah, you can move to the to the next slide. So, I mean, there are several ways to define DevOps. At the end of the day, I think it's important to understand that we're talking about knowledge work. We're talking about people. We're talking about um, relationships with people. So it's something intangible, so difficult to even to describe, you know. Uh, so there are several terminologies, several ways, as I said, to define DevOps. The one that resonates the most with me is the one that uh, basically floats around the DORA uh, concept. Okay, DORA is DevOps Research and Assessment. I actually feel very lucky that I happen to know, um, I think, one of the most prominent uh, um, researchers in the DevOps area, Gene Kim. He actually came to, uh, to my city here in Prato about 10 years ago after he wrote this book called The Phoenix Project. And uh, he actually came for the first time in Italy. And I think meeting him and, you know, that conference was a life changer for me, okay? So I've been always following his work, okay? To the point that, you know, in, uh, I think it was 2017, he wrote this book called uh, Accelerate. Ac the Accelerate book actually originated from this uh, research uh, study that he did and it was called Dora. So together with him, there's, there's also uh, Dr. Uh, Forsgren and also Jess Humble, I don't know if you know him, but uh, is, if, you, if you have the continuous integration book, uh, he wrote, he was one of the authors of that book. So even Jess Humble is a, is a, a great expert. So I was very lucky to, to follow this group of researchers over the years and actually practice what, what they were discovering over time uh, throughout the years at second quarter. So I think I, I've, I've picked this, this kind of assessment to define the next, uh, the next capabilities. I would, I would just uh, focus on the technical capabilities. I will just keep skim through them. You know, the, you know, the slides will, all the slides will have links to each of these capabilities you can go through for details. So, and if you have questions, I suggest, you know, you just, if you want maybe to talk more about a specific capability, we can, we can talk about them. The idea of this is to uh, then introduce uh, Kubernetes and how Kubernetes can help, uh, you know, our organizations in a true DevOps uh, uh, organization. Okay. So the first capability is something that probably now we take for granted, you know, everyone, especially after the advent of GitHub, uh, everyone probably uses version control. So this is probably the number one foundation of a technical cap capability. If you don't use a version control system, there's basically no way you can perform as an organization, as a development organization today. So you can use version control to organize source code, but even configuration files. So this is important. For the, for the following capabilities. But you see that all the following capabilities are based on, on, uh, on, uh, on this one, okay? So yeah, this one is trunk-based development. It's another important way of, of organizing your development workflow. Uh, over, you know, this study has, uh, has revealed that if you have long-lived 
branches in your uh, development uh, workflow, <clears throat> you end up maybe releasing every four, five, six months. And the cognitive load to maintain a, a branch that deviates from the trunk, from the main branch, is actually too much for the developers to, to uh, hold. So the idea is to actually work in smaller batches <clears throat> and to uh, try and have this continuous flow of ideas of features through incremental changes that flow into main. So main becomes your, you know, trunk, your, uh, your, the, 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 the path for uh, your, the future of your software, the present and the future. Uh, so once you've got uh, version control and trunk development, the next step is to uh, integrate the changes that you've got in these small uh, uh, branches into the, uh, the main branch, okay? This will also be important for, for the continuous delivery mindset that we'll introduce later. But the idea here is uh, to obtain fast feedback when you change the code so that, the, so that you can improve the quality of the software directly into the product. So don't wait for uh, like mass inspection uh, and mass testing before the release. Make sure that you uh, get feedback uh, immediately every time you, 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 you develop a, a patch. And this is in line what, with what Dr. Deming was saying in the 80s. You know, Dr. Deming was the father of, of the Toyota production system and, and, and lean management. So he used to say that it is important to build quality into the product. And this is one way of doing this with software, okay? So it's, it, the, the next step is to actually use what we've done to, so uh, can you please go back, Ian? One important step is about the automated builds. So um, if we, so we write a patch, we commit, we push, we have the, the test that pass. And then at the end of the, the continuous integration process, we build uh, some artifacts, okay? So these artifacts, and that's the next slide, they are important because they allow us to test immediately what we have built by automatically deploying them. So, uh, it's basically uh, writing, for example, GitHub actions that automate uh, the manual tasks that you would do as a manual tester um, so that you can discover problems at an early stage of the development life cycle. Also, um, the, the, the important thing is that the process is the same, no matter the environment you, you deploy on. So that's also, that gives you reproducibility in importance because you can repeat the same task with the same results. That's what you need to achieve. The only difference between environments is the, the configuration options or the, the settings for the environment. If it's production, you've got some credentials, maybe even you know, some people cannot even access to some uh, credential. To, I mean, ideally, only the, 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 the automated pipeline can deploy in production and so on. <clears throat> so the next slide, is about, so once you have deployed what you have produced, you can actually run tests in an automated way and continuously. So uh, these start with, uh, you know, there are some customer facing and technology facing tests, and also some that can be automated or some that can be, uh, that can be manual. The good thing is that uh, you can be as creative as you want here. Also, if, you, if your product is part of a larger and co more complex system, you can have uh, uh, integration tests with, uh, with uh, other components. So you can also, for example, deploy Postgres with uh, uh, the extension for Postgres that you write so that you can test if you change the extension, how this uh, in interacts with Postgres and the different versions of Postgres. <clears throat> so this is a, a, an example of, of how, I mean, on the right, on the left side, uh, 
we have, for example, a small set of unit tests, small set of integration tests, and also made a test. And we leave everything uh, for manual tests. So we end up with an ice cream cone kind of uh, uh, setup or inverted uh, pyramid. Okay, this is not ideal. So uh, the DORA project actually describes how you can actually go or measure the pro the, your journey from uh, the left uh, case to the right case and build the, the actual pyramid of, of tests where pretty much everything is automated and you can leave uh, manual manual testing as a, as a last resource, maybe, maybe before a release, even though I think what we should aim for is continuous delivery slash continuous deployment. Um, do you see also, um, you know, a match from this manual testing in the pyramid where, where it's like the cloud on top of the pyramid matched back to the graph in the previous um, slide where, you know, it's, it's really about the yeah. critical testing, which is in, in the top of the cloud? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot, yeah, the, yeah there's, uh, you know, strict relationship between the, the previous metrics and these one, if you can, I mean, if you look there, probably the, yeah, most of them are the same, same names. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the idea is to not remove manual tests, uh, but uh, provide uh, high, the, the highest level of confidence in a, in a release, which leads to continuous delivery. Uh, um, by, by translating the manual test into automated tests. So ideally you start with the manual test and then you program that into an automated test. Also cool. we see how in Kubernetes things get more complicated and also with Postgres, because let's not forget Postgres we've got five, five supported versions. <clears throat> so continuous delivery, you know, here there's, you know, as I said, you've got a few, a few items. What really helped me, for example, at second quarter, when, when I was in charge of, of support, the global 24 seven support is to work, not just in the department, but throughout the organization. Okay, so building this kind of mindset uh, with all the product developers that we had at, at second quarter back, de back then to think about continuous delivery, okay? So every, every actor in the development process is critical. So, okay, for example, the developer cannot just say, okay, I don't care, you know, I just push, then it's the support people problem. No, because in the end, that's the same pipeline that gets to the customer and the customer is not happy or the end user, okay? So everyone has to do their own, their own part. What really helped me here was to focus on, on the fact that when you are in continuous delivery, you are 100% sure that the version that you've got on the trunk, so on main, the latest version, is the best version of the software uh, that you write ever. So the, the best version you've ever written of that software is the latest commit on main. That's what, that's what, it, what helps, for example, if you've got a, for example, uh, a hotfix release to, 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 to do, you know that main is what or the latest release that you've got for a, for a that is committed you've got for a release is the best version for that release or for that time, you know. So this kind of mindset, and you can only go there if you've done all the things that we mentioned before in an automated way. Okay, I think this, is, this is most, most. And if you can do it, so that's continuous delivery. That opens up, you know, continuous deployment, which we'll see. In, in preparation for this webinar, this was indeed the thing that, you know, got me puzzled to boast that delivery is, is more of a, a state of doing something where deployment is actually doing it. That, and exactly. that there is this clear difference. Yeah. And also because, you know, some of the software we write, we want to have a fixed cadence or releasing. Otherwise, you can just have, for example, I can even mention that in our big animal, offering, you know, Beganimal is the database as a service that EDB writes, there are some components that, you know, are in continuous deployment, okay? So, you know, that when we deliver them, to, theoretically, they could, you know, at least, you know, in, in uh, pre-production or, or development, there's continuous delivery, and then, you know, there's human supervision that, you know, needs to um, 
you know, accept the, the installation in, in pre-production and, and production, but theoretically we're ready for that, you know. So it's, it's a really good place where to be. Then architecture, this is another technical capability and this is uh, the less opinionated, you know. So basically there's no necessary, no good architecture for everyone. Uh, essentially, every organization needs to understand what works for the, that organization. At the end of the day, IT systems, IT organizations are, are complex and, and living systems. So all, every, every, every team is different, every organization is different, must be treated like that, you know. So everything works if uh, it works for that organization or, or the team. So, there are essentially, you know, the monolithic architecture that you mentioned before, which is fine. And it might work for many organizations, but it might not work for others. It might be more oriented towards a microservice organization. What I have experienced in my, in my career so far is that no matter how you, you want to ignore Conway's law, you have to think that it exists. So Conway law, Conway's law is basically saying that IT systems reflect the organization of, of the structure of, the organi of an organization. So, and remap the communication systems between human beings in how we, we develop our systems and components. So you can, as I said, you can ignore it as you, as you want, but ultimately you have to, I think, at least consider that. And if you want to, uh, um, beat, the, beat Conway's law, you need to make an effort in terms of communication and cross-team uh, cooperation, cross-department cooperation to, to, to um, override it. So the other important thing to consider is cognitive load. So cognitive load is uh, it's defined as the amount of information you can keep in your, in your head about the software, you know. So the idea is by having microservice uh, uh, architecture that also includes the database, we have the capability to uh, uh, constrain the cognitive load that each team that is responsible for a product needs to carry. Okay, so by working with clear APIs, we can let different teams, different products, uh, you know, cooperate uh, in, a, in, a, in a very uh, efficient way. <clears throat> so this one is another important one. I mean, I think it's while, you know, we have to consider about the extremes. Okay. So the comp there's, you know, the organization that decides the tools, this, the processes and, you know, that, that needs to be, need to be imposed. I think we, you know, the other extreme is that every team chooses, you know, there's complete anarchy and everything chooses, uh, you know, the tools, processes that they want. Yeah, I think it needs to be, there needs to be balanced also because ultimately uh, priorities and, and results need, need to be funneled, you know, to the executive, uh, uh, executive team of an organization. So, but again, uh, this, is, this is an important slide for me because it, it establishes the, the, the importance of talking about people, how central the people uh, and individuals and teams are in, in, a, in a DevOps kind of environment, especially given the complexity of the systems that we are developing, sometimes the ambiguity, the volatility, also the uncertainty of, of the surrounding world working in a team with multidisciplinary skills that can uh, provide you know, constructive uh, feedback and, and input is probably the most effective way to innovate nowadays. So when it comes, this is very important when, when we talk about databases, it's about management of test data. So you need to uh, you know, if you want to test your, your applications, you need a way to, to inject meaningful data. So this is, this is important. Then uh, again, what I was mentioning before was the, I mean, the importance, I mean, I was mentioning Demi, 
uh, is to build quality into the product. And now we have uh, the responsibility as an organization to create a security aware kind of mentality where instead of leaving security again as a downstream process before a release, we actually make it part as an upstream process, the, you know, part of, of, of the, the actual development workflow. So for example, with Kubernetes, uh, we can, for example, have and pipelines, we can uh, also uh, scan the code, but also uh, scan the container images. So we'll see that in a slide later. And then another important capability that is related to the automated, uh, to the data management, is how do we make sure that we can change, uh, apply database changes when we commit a change for the application. So I've seen this work well when, if we use, if we use the migration capabilities of the language that we use, uh, maybe with an ORM or something like that, you know? So if we program the changes to the database and PostgreSQL works really well with these. I mean, let's not forget we've got uh, um, um, transactional DDL. So we can make changes to the database and revert them in an atomic way. So this is, this is a very important capability that we, we often forget, but Postgres has got it, you know, uh, out of the box. And then we also have JSON. So this is a very important, um, you know, uh, uh, a, a capability that PostgreSQL offers and that developers can take advantage of. So all we, we got uh, optimized uh, ways to change or to introduce uh, columns in tables and so on, so that you can even have uh, canary deployments or blue green deployments with your, with your database, Postgres database. So this is actually a, an area where we are doing a lot of research with our cloud native offering at ADB. So cloud infrastructure, I think this is, uh, you know, another important, uh, what you were mentioning before, transition from Postgres to cloud. I think the cloud, you know, the importance of ha having on-demand provisioning and, and resource pooling and elasticity. Uh, I mean, before, you know, with the, with the data tradition data centers, we had to purchase, uh, you know, hardware to, you know, increase uh, our our infrastructure now it's all uh, about you know purchasing uh, virtual machines from uh, the most common cloud providers. And this this is also what we saw back in in the presentation uh, from from Mike Stonebreaker. Really, that cloud adoption first and foremost was about this elasticity. So that that is that is a very important capability. Yeah. Yes. I mean, the, the, the Dora, um, you know, if you, you know, if the, the audience wants to click on, you know, once we've got the slides on that link, uh, that also explains the main characteristics, is expected characteristics of, of cloud services. For example, even the, the SLA or SLA, yeah, the, the guaranteed service levels, these are all expected capabilities from, for, uh, for a cloud. Um, infrastructure. So now so, we've got, yeah. Chris, go yeah, I, I think I think we want to give Crystal quickly the the opportunity. Yes, sure. So we have um, one more question to pose to the audience, um, and I've just launched that. It's that um, we're asking, how would you agree with the statement that um, your development pipeline looks like the graphic that Gabrielle is going to show? So we'll leave that up for you for a minute. Cool. So Gabrielle. Yeah, yeah. So thanks. Thanks. You know, I mean, this slide is uh, basically a recap of the technical capabilities and hopefully I'll be able to provide some of the reasons why I believe uh, Kubernetes is uh, at the same time the expression of uh, the result of, of the DevOps movement but at the same time is also the fuel that uh, accelerates the speed 
and rate of change that uh, will enable all organizations, I mean, every organization in the world to, to produce innovation and to be, to generate uh, value, especially, uh, you know, business value. So not only, I mean, business value as defined by Mark Schwartz, who's, who's an author that is, like, works with, that works with uh, Jim Kim, Jim Kim's team, business value is uh, higher than customer value. I mean, sometimes we think that customer is, uh, you know, number one priority, but if we actually think that, uh, you know, for example, employees or staff is even, as even a higher priority, so be before the customer, it's actually when we believe that uh, the customer will have more benefits. So it's about creating a generative, generative culture, uh, like, you know, Dr. Westrum, uh, if, you, if you want to, you know, I'll, I'll provide some details, defines. So create uh, an organization that is uh, focused on people, on making people happy, making people responsible, making people accountable, making people, um, you know, passionate about, about what they do. Okay, so I think this is ultimately what DevOps does. And, you know, uh, ultimately, you know, I hope hopefully, and hopefully I'll be able to uh, let you see how Kubernetes can, can be part of this, of this game. So it all starts with the developer writing a patch, like, you know, we, we use Git and uh, the developer issues a, a pull request and uh, you can adopt your workflow like you know github workflow so we use as i said version control we write in a developer branch <clears throat> and then that triggers automated testing uh, static code analysis like i was mentioning before so we already start to shift left on security we already start to practice test automation again Trunk-based development is important here because we are going to uh, check the code against, um, against the main branch. And continuous integration is again, what builds also uh, the container image. So if everything, think about this process, if there's a failure, the process stops. So the aim here is to stop uh, at the first problem that we encounter so that we can provide feedback to the developer because maybe there's a problem. So the developer is independent here. So it is important to let the developer be part of this process. So once the, the, the test fail, they can, in the development branch, they can make changes. So once we have built the images, what happens now, and this is what I, uh, why I believe that Kubernetes will, will increase the velocity of development so velocity is how many could be measured several, several things, but also how many features you can develop and produce and, and, and bring to the customer, okay, to the end user. We can use Kubernetes to test what we, what we built. And by using test automation, uh, we can, and deployment automation. So for example, we can define in our version control system, the configuration of the Kubernetes cluster that we want to to deploy it could be even you know on AKS, EKS, uh, GKE. It could be in standard Kubernetes. We can define in a declarative way all these settings and let them be part of of the uh, automated testing that we have, and decide, for example, different levels of of tests: automated tests, casual tests, nicely test, and so on. <clears throat> so yeah, if you can go on so basically here we also have some some feedback so if there's some problems you know the developer needs to go back otherwise if everything goes fine we could add peer review to the process so have other people in the team review what the developer first developer has done and by doing this way we increase also the likely likelihood of discovering bugs of uh, security security issues but also it's a, this is a good way to mentor and introduce new people in the team. And again, create that generative uh, uh, organizational culture I was, I was referring to before. So when, if everything is fine, you know, this is, you know, continuous integration, trunk-based development, we merge on main. And 
you know, we are ready to think about continuous delivery here. So every now and then, depending on the release policy, we can push the container images to the container registry. This could be done automatically. If all the tests pass, we could use conventional commits and semantic versioning to define um, uh, the, the releases. We can uh, also uh, introduce continuous deployment. And then the last step is to let the user uh, benefit from what we've done. So this is what generates uh, you know, the, the value for the business. I hope that's clear. Absolutely. Um, Crystal, our poll, do you have some good answers to share with us? Yes. Um, looks like there's just a few coming in now that everybody um, can see the yeah. full graphic, but it mm -hmm. looks like most people landed um, kind of in the neutral zone. So I'll share those results with you for a minute. Cool. So it's a, it's a nicely it's a nice pyramid of answers in you know where folks put themselves in you know having fully this this flow implemented. Thanks, Gabriele. So what what I will do in closing is just go through some of the um, results that you know also from the Dora uh, project they do an inventory. I, I think they did that since two thousand seventeen really on what the state of DevOps is within organizations. Um, if I get my screen to advance. Um, so really understanding how an organization works with um, DevOps is really about metrics. It's all about measuring, you know, um, how efficiently and how quickly are you deploying? So lead time for changes, time to restore a service after something breaks. How quickly are you actually deploying? Is this, you know, what Gabriele said in the beginning, once every six months or once every six hours? That is obviously a very um, distinct difference in, in, in how, you know, eloquent, how quickly, how agile uh, you are in, you know, building and deploying your, your software and what is the change failure rate? Those were the four major metrics. What we now see is actually an operational performance. Um, obviously, we all probably remember this, this mime of this girl um, that stands before the burning house and said, you know, it, it worked on my computer. It's now Opsos problem. Um, really, the reliability of what I've built, what I've tested, and what I've deployed, how reliable is that? So these are the five key metrics that you know um, define your, your your quality with with DevOps in that sense. Um, so that's been measured, and what we've seen over the last couple of years is what what's highlighted here, um, where uh, there are actually two major growths here. It's not just you know, you as an organization fitting in um, low, medium, high, or even elite, uh, because you can see, you know, from 2018 to 2019, um, a lot of organizations shifted from high to medium, but that has also has to do with the fact that the quantitative measures for all of these classifications grow um, very importantly from 2019 to 2021. Uh, obviously, this reliability metric um was added and you know then seeing from 2019 to 2021 that again a lot of organizations moved from medium to high but also uh, a lot more moved to elite um, not just says that they're more capable of doing this but they're also capable of hit hitting these higher quality metrics um, so that's that's a very interesting thing to see and to observe and really also the growth and the importance of DevOps and by extent Kubernetes for, uh, for this kind of DevOps um, environment. I've enclosed the, the link to the research report here. So when you get the slides, you can uh, also look at that yourself, but you know, elite performance, 6,570 times quicker lead time from commit to deploy. That is incredible if you start looking at 
the velocity of getting new features to your business, of getting you know things solved, 2,570 times quicker recover from incidents. If you have, if you are a bank, and your internet banking app has a problem, and that would take two days to fix, that's that's unacceptable. So this, these kind of numbers are achievable if you start looking at, you know, adopting the graph that Gabriele painted out really for your organization to really get to this next level of, um, of things. And I think this is super exciting. Um, I'm not gonna read all of this text. It's a wall, a wall of words, but it's really the definition of cloud native. The fact that it is a mindset, um, loosely coupled systems. I'm just gonna pick a couple of words from this um, to, to really highlight a little bit or, you know, moving Postgres cloud, cloud native, the way that you approach this, how this all starts fitting together with Kubernetes, with um, this entire mindset and with this entire development. Um, and that is going to take us closely to the end of our session here this afternoon. Um, EDB Postgres for Kubernetes, our capabilities that we're building, you know, really um, trying to enable true DevOps with Postgres, um, deploy anywhere, automate DBA tasks, avoid lock-in. What Gabrielli also said is in Big Animal, we're actually using this. It is available for you to, to start looking at and, and deploying. Um, and I think this is my closing slide. Um, we're super excited to be at KubeCon, uh, Cloud NativeCon in um, Valencia in Spain, uh, May 20, 16 to 20. It's also going to be virtual. Um, so really mark that date because something very important is going to happen there. Um, I can't tell you anything, but it's going to be super, super exciting. Um, and with that, actually, I am at the end of, of um, our presentation we have prepared here uh, today for you. Gabriele, I don't know if you have any closing wisdom no, no, for I... us this afternoon. No, no, you said everything. And yeah, I, you know, I'm really happy to close with this slide, you know, I actually be there, I will actually be there. So, it, you know, some of the people in the audience want, want to, wants to come to our booth, you know, just come and say hi. And yeah, that'll be, as you said, exciting news for that day. Excellent. Well, thank you, um, Jan and Gabrielli. We are kind of at the top of the hour here, but it, it also looks like we are without any um, outstanding questions. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. As a reminder, you will receive the slides and the recording as soon as we have those ready for you. And of course, we encourage you to reach out and connect with our team if you have any questions. So thanks again, Jan and Gabrielli, and have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you. Ciao, Jan. Thanks. And Ciao Gabriele, Ciao Crystal. Bye. Yeah.